It's okay. My name is Richard Morrock, <clears throat> and the title of my talk is "How America Got Trumped." Now, my background is I'm a uh, post-primal political scientist, as opposed to a psychoanalytic historian. Now, I also work as a taxi driver out in Long Island, so I interact with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds and social classes. Not too many billionaires, though. <clears throat> Donald Trump's upset victory in the 2016 election was due to a combination of factors, not all of equal importance. In the final analysis, while Hillary Clinton won nearly three million more votes than Donald Trump, he was given the presidency by the Electoral College. This obsolete relic from the 18th century should have been reformed or abolished long ago. Originally intended to prevent Virginia from dominating the rest of the country, it even failed in that respect, because most of our early presidents turned out to be from that state. In recent years, there have been two occasions, 2000 and 2016, when the people voted for the Democratic presidential candidate <clears throat> only to see a Republican given the election because of the distribution of the votes. For example, Hillary got one California by 29% and one DC by about 90% but she still lost because a lot of the other states went for Donald Trump narrowly, but some went pretty strongly for him. <clears throat> uh, curiously, none of the protest marches and demonstrations since Trump's inauguration have raised the matter of changing the Electoral College. Yeah. There were three debates between the two leading presidential candidates, and Hillary Clinton won all of them, two by significant margins. For all the talk about the failures of her campaign, she still managed to raise far more money than Trump, whose own campaign was probably the most inept in our history. The campaign manager had to be replaced twice, and at one point, the petulant plutocrat was trailing Mrs. Clinton by as much as 21 points. Many pundits have attributed Trump's victory to surviving racism. This certainly was a factor in his triumph, as I can attest after talking to my fellow taxi drivers in Long Island. But many of his supporters in states like Wisconsin, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and Ohio were Obama voters in 2008 and even in 2012. Trump did better among black voters, that is male black voters, than either his two GOP predecessors, John McCain and Mitt Romney. <coughs> of course, Trump was not running against a black candidate, nor like Romney, was he a member of a church which once openly discriminated against its black members. But it seems odd to suggest that racist voters in swing states would vote for a black Democratic candidate one year, and then switch to the GOP in a year when both presidential candidates were white. Was America ready for a woman president? Does misogyny play a major role in Trump's victory? Uh, it turns out that even though women have been generally voting for the Democrats, Trump won a majority of white women voters while scoring in the low single digits among black women. Uh, this averaged out to less than half of the female vote, but it wasn't significantly worse than what other Republican candidates received when they were running against male opponents. Hillary's gender did not win her too many votes. <clears throat> Breaking down the white female vote, it turned out that single white women were less enthusiastic about Trump than married white women. This may tell us something about the nature of the Trump victory, but what? <clears throat> there were some who believed that the neglected heartland went for Trump in 2016, while the prosperous coasts went for the Democrats. This would not apply to Idaho, uh, most, much of which uh, was experiencing an economic boom and went for Trump anyway, or to a place like Garden City in Nassau County, New York, which is a very wealthy community which voted for Trump in a county which leaned more towards Hillary. And it is odd that resentment against the coastal elite would translate into support for a billionaire real estate mogul who lived in a Manhattan penthouse. Uh, much of the country had been left behind to some degree by the slow recovery from the devastating 2008 recession. But why did people vote for the same party that brought about that recession in the first place? Trump's actual appeal was to xenophobia. His campaign was saturated with it. Xenophobia is superficially similar to racism, 
but the psychological underpinnings are a bit different. Perinatal rather than edible, the belief in maintaining the purity of your society rather than keeping certain people in their place and forcing them to behave a certain way, <coughs> as our parents did to us in childhood. Though Trump accused the legal Mexican immigrants of being responsible for crimes such as murder and rape, although immigrants in general are less likely to commit crimes than native-born citizens. Of course, if you take a group of millions of people, you can always find some lawbreakers among them. <clears throat> there was the well-publicized promise to build a wall along the Mexican border, uh, and there was also the proposal to ban all Muslim immigrants on grounds of their religion, which was an unconstitutional suggestion and undermined Trump's later plan to exclude only immigrants from certain Muslim-majority countries. As it happens, none of the terrorists who've inflicted death and destruction on the United States since 1993 came from any of the countries on Trump's list. Fifteen were from Saudi Arabia, three from Egypt, and five were born in the United States. <coughs> While the others are from a variety of countries which escaped Trump's notice, including non-Muslim countries such as England, the, the Shoe Bomber, France, Zacharias Mousavi, and Russia, the Tam uh, Sarnaev brothers. In my book, I detail what I call the Adawa cycle, which involves a delayed reaction, typically 15 years, to a massive trauma to a nation. Uh, there, the original uh, incident was in Italy, where 15 years after the Battle of Adawa, you started to have a real war. Uh, the, uh, a, war th a thirst for war, which led to the war with Turkey, and then after that to World War I, and that led directly to fascism. In Germany, uh, Germany's unexpected defeat in 1918 led to Hitler's victory 15 years later, 1933. There are other examples from China, Russia, France, Japan, and several smaller countries, and now it is America's turn. We should expect to find a traumatic experience 15 years prior to Trump's election, and it turned out it's the terrorist attack on September 11th, 2001, almost to the very month. For the first time in its recent history, the U.S. felt vulnerable, not to a powerful nation like Japan, which had a large state-of-the-art navy in 1941, but to a shadowy band of fanatics with obscure aims. Our initial response was summed up in the slogan, United We Stand indicating that there would be no scapegoating of innocent Muslims in response to the terrorist attack. Fifteen years later, this has changed. Part of the reason for this is the normal turnover of the population. And as an increasing percentage of our electorate consists of young people whose political ideas had been formed 15 years earlier. But there are also the two massacres of innocent civilians in San Bernardino and Orlando, which had the effect of promoting Trump's fortunes. Orlando happened in the middle of the campaign, and Trump's support increased substantially in its wake. Most Muslims in America may be loyal and law-abiding, but it is now clear that a few are not. And how are we supposed to tell the difference? Trump's original suggestion that we should ban all Muslim immigrants until we know what's going on struck a chord with many Americans who might not have supported his views on economic or social matters. If Trump did better among married white women than single ones, this may be because single women are often concerned first about their careers, while married women worry more about their family's safety. What was going on in San Bernardino and Orlando, and I would be happy to explain it to our new president, is that Al-Qaeda is trying to avenge the death of their leader, Osama bin Laden, something that our counter-terrorism experts might have seen coming. The hijacking of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 which I discussed last year in an earlier presentation, saw Pakistan and Al-Qaeda cooperating closely with each other. It gave Al-Qaeda leverage over Pakistan. Al-Qaeda knows what happened to the plane, that it was hijacked to Pakistan. It never went into the Indian Ocean. That's why they haven't found it. Uh, and it allowed them to mobilize Pakistan's network of agents in the United States, which had been active for decades. I even saw them in action back in 1970. <clears throat> to wreak their vengeance. The gunman in San Bernardino, Saeed Rizwan Farouk, was born and raised in the United States, but spent a year in Pakistan, apparently being trained as a terrorist. His wife, Tafshin Malik, was born in Pakistan, 
where it spent most of the life in Saudi Arabia, the same country which cooperated with Al-Qaeda on 9-11. Trump himself noted this during the campaign, but the first country he visited once he became president was Saudi Arabia, where he attended a big summit meeting and hailed Saudi Arabia as an ally in the war against terrorism. But with allies like that, we don't need enemies. Saeed Farouk's original plan was to attack Disneyland, most likely during the Christmas vacation of 2015, when it would be filled with families with children. The idea probably came from Adam Gadan, an Al-Qaeda leader who was raised in Southern California and converted to Islam in his late teens. I've discussed him also in one presentation. Adam had visited Disneyland several times as a youngster, and it was only a matter of time before he persuaded to his terrorist cohorts to attack the iconic amusement park. Saudi Arabia may have dissuaded Al-Qaeda from attacking American targets after 9-11 for fear of losing American support in its cold war with Shiite Iran. But Al-Qaeda's leading patron is now Pakistan, and the disappearance of MH370, which was hijacked at Gilgit in northern Pakistan, where the passengers and crew were killed, gave them something to hold over the Islamabad regime. In August 2016, our national security agency, at my suggestion, uh, contacted Pakistan's Inter-Service Intelligence, ISI, asking whether they might be thinking of giving nuclear weapons to their Al-Qaeda allies. About a week or so later, Hamid Ghul, the former head of the ISI, who was then serving as the ISI's liaison to Al-Qaeda, died of a cerebral hemorrhage, although he was in good health otherwise. That cerebral hemorrhage was probably 38 calories. When the ISI realized that the U.S. knew of their plan to hand over nuclear weapons to the pan-Islamic terrorists, they gave their former chief a one-way ticket to the next world. He'll be happy that the virgins can't <laughs> wait for it. But while the, nu with the nuclear option foreclosed, Al-Qaeda began its plans to use conventional means to inflict massive damage to the United States. The Disneyland attack was meant to be as bloody as 9-11, witness the 19 guns found in Farouk's home. Uh, corresponding to the number of terrorists involved in the 9-11 attack. The couple was no doubt expecting company, but something went wrong, and I think what happened was when Farouk went to his office, he was greeted by a fellow who worked there, one of the victims, Nicholas Thalassinos. This man was an Islamophobe and a bit of a nutcase. He'd been on the internet denouncing Muslims, denouncing President Obama as a Muslim, and uh, I think what happened is he said to Farouk, well, you wreckage going to blow up Disneyland now. This is in relation to what had just happened in Paris. Unfortunately, he was talking to the very guy who was planning to blow up Disneyland. He had no idea. He was just being sarcastic. And Farouk probably thought that his plans were leaking like a sieve. His fellow workers knew everything about it. So he went back to his house, got his wife, two guns, and went back and killed everybody, including Thalassinos. As tragic as this event may have been, it could have been far worse if the original plan had succeeded. But once again, as with the nuclear weapons, the U.S. dodged the bullet. Months later, during the summer of 2016, as the presidential candidate campaign heated up, the FBI was warned, again by me, that there could be another terrorist attack either against Disneyland or Disney World in Orlando, the place that Omar Mateen was checking out. The FBI, which had already questioned Omar Mateen on two occasions, concluding that he was no threat, I wonder what they think now, did nothing, although a single phone call to Omar might have reverted the Pulse nightclub massacre and saved 49 lives. Apparently, Omar Mateen had been looking at Disney World but concluded that a lone gunman would not be able to inflict a large number of casualties there. A big amusement park would have too many places for the victims to take cover. The Pulse nightclub was selected instead, not because it catered to gays, but simply because it was a good place to trap and kill a large number of people. If Omar had only wanted to go after the gays, he would have probably gone south with the Key West, roughly the same distance. Two months after the Pulse massacre, Omar's father, Sadiq, an immigrant from Afghanistan with Taliban sympathies, showed up at a Hillary Clinton rally in Kissimmee, close to Orlando. He seemed relaxed and was smiling as he took pictures with his cell phone. It seemed strange for a man who had just lost his son, especially uh, 
uh, considering the circumstances. In fact, he was probably checking the security in the hope of assassinating Mrs. Clinton. It was no accident that Trump's victory in November was celebrated by ISIS. Pan-Islamists and Islamophobes alike share common enemies, Jews, gays, women, democracy. They hate our freedoms and feed off one another. Sadiq Mateen, who heads a one-man Afghan government in exile and calls for the overthrow of the government in Kabul, which the U.S. is fighting to defend, is obviously a Pakistani agent and was a link between the ISI and his son. 49 people died in Orlando, but the Pakistan Al-Qaeda alliance was evidently hoping for more. Yet the tragedy still clearly shifted the polls in Donald Trump's favor. For all the talk about Russia intervening in our election, there has been nothing said about Pakistan's efforts to export terrorists into the United States, as they have been doing in regard to India for many years, or the effect that this might have had on the 2016 election. The man directly behind the San Bernardino and Orlando massacres was Tariq Aziz, until recently the Pakistani defense attaché in Washington, and once the top aide of his old friend, former Pakistani dictator Pervez Musharraf. Aziz is the man who tipped the CIA off to Osama bin Laden's location in Abbottabad and was generously rewarded for this by our government, receiving most of the $25 million reward. The information was apparently confirmed by water warning boarding a captured Al-Qaeda courier, but the tale in the film Zero Dark Thirty, showing our spies calculating that a compound that contained three women must also house their three husbands, presumably including bin Laden, was pure fiction. As everyone outside Hollywood knows, a Muslim man is allowed to marry up to four wives. Tariq Aziz knew bin Laden's location because he was the one who set him up there in the first place to protect Musharraf after Al-Qaeda made two attempts to assassinate him <coughs> back in 2003. <coughs> bin Laden, in exchange for removing Musharraf from his death list, received a three-story compound with a communication center on the second floor and was able to fight the Americans in Afghanistan, where Pakistan had been conducting its proxy war for years, originally with U.S. help against the Soviets. Officially, Pakistan only wants a friendly government in Kabul so that it will not be facing a two-front fight if it is attacked by India, which it never has been. There have been about five wars between Pakistan and India. Pakistan started every single one of them. Then I worried about Afghanistan. They wanted to annex it. That will give them access to the former Soviet Central Asian republics, which have enormous amounts of oil, vast agricultural land, and industrial base, mostly in Tashkent, and millions of people. This would create a major power, which would be a revival of the empire of Tamerlane complete with the mountains of severed hands that they've done over in Bangladesh. And this a state that size, from access to the sea, oil, nuclear weapons, to a quarter of a billion people could be a major power in the world. Al-Qaeda is favoring this, and Pakistan needs Al-Qaeda to win over the Muslims of Central Asia, because that's the only thing they have in common, which is religion. After the overthrow of Musharraf, Aziz was reassigned to the Washington Embassy, where he made contact with the CIA and, figuring Musharraf didn't need protection anymore, sold out bin Laden for the reward. Ironically, al-Qaeda is now <coughs> trying to avenge his lead his death by relying on the very individual who betrayed him to the U.S. in the first place. The FBI has been asked repeatedly to arrest Sadiq Mateen, but nothing has been done. I also spoke to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement had a conversation with the guy. And you, this guy was either, was either testing me or he was completely out of his mind. I looked at the Google Earth and I saw mass graves on either side of the estuary. So the town is in a very narrow valley. It was the only place they could have buried them. And I said, it looks like the mass grave. It was right on the route if the plane had gone north, which the Thai radar spotted it to me. And the British said, no, it went south. And they've been looking for it ever since. They still haven't found it. And he was telling me, well, maybe the Pakistanis have dogs to chase away the birds, Canadian geese in Kashmir. <laughs> and the dogs would dig, dig rectangular holes perfectly 
rectangular, two of them matching on each side of the airstrip, about uh, 200 square yards or more in size. I don't think so. <laughs> and then we also got into the, the Kennedy assassination. And I was telling him, you look at the Warren report, it says that Kennedy was shot from the front, he had a large gaping hole in the rear. He said, well, you don't know anything about ballistics. What I do know, you don't get a large gaping hole from an entrance wound. Uh, this guy, he may have been just testing me, but he may have been completely nut. And uh, they didn't do it. Sudeik is still a college. And uh, Aziz is no longer in the embassy, from what I hear from the FBI, from my contact. But if Sadiq were to implicate him in the Orlando massacre, if he's back in Pakistan, he's going to meet the same fate as Hamid Ghul, I suspect. The FBI receives $3 billion a year, billion, to fight terrorism. They dropped the ball with Omar Mateen, giving him a clean bill of health. They did nothing when they were warned about a possible attack in Orlando. They were asked by Russia about Tamerlan Tsarnaev, the leader of the yeah. Boston Mass Marathon bombing. But he replied, they replied he was not a threat. They were warned about Major Nadal Hassan, the Fort Hood killer, and did nothing. They knew about David Coleman Headley, He's a half American, half Pakistani, uh, who was recruited by the ISI, and he played a key role in the Mumbai massacre, in which uh, over 160 people were killed, including six Americans. Again, they did nothing. And back in 2001, four, four accomplices in the 9-11 attack were allowed by the FBI to board the Saudi plane, which took royals and the Laden relatives back to the kingdom. Three of them were extradited six years later, when the Saudis decided to cooperate with the United States. The fourth is probably dead, but it's not certain. The 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, plus the more recent massacres in San Bernardino and Orlando, particularly Orlando, fueled the xenophobia that led to Donald Trump's election. The Democrats were quick to respond to the threats to loyal Muslim citizens, which was quite right. But they had almost nothing to say at their convention about the threat to all Americans posed by pan-Islamist terrorists. It's hard to walk that fine line, but it has to be done. They, this played right into Donald Trump's hands. Meanwhile, the FBI has done virtually nothing to protect the public from known pan-Islamist extremists. The American people deserve to know why. I don't want to get into my own theory about that, because I can't prove any of it. But I suspect that Army intelligence blackmailing the FBI, which in turn is pressuring the State Department. And uh, Army intelligence has, has its agenda putting the extreme right in power, which more or less succeeded, although Donald Trump may be a little bit less reliable than, uh, than they would have preferred. They probably would have liked uh, Rand Paul or, uh, or uh, Ted Cruz. Okay, that's my paper, and I'll open it up. To